Good morning and welcome to this week's IGTV. I am talking about understanding and navigating teen promiscuity, which can feel like a very shameful, dirty subject where you failed as a parent and somehow your teenager is broken. Rest assured, neither one of those things is true and what I wanna give you today is some tools and perspective to better understand what your teenager's doing and why and um, um, tools to navigate and support your teenager in a way that's going to change the situation as opposed to drive them to do more of it. My name is Allie Payne and I am a certified life coach. I'm a certified relationship systems coach and I have been working with parents and teens for the last 15 years to help them to better understand each other to stop the emotional blow-ups, the stressful silences, and feeling like parents are at their wits end, hopeless, defeated, and heartbroken, to create relationships that are built on trust and respect. Again, my name is Allie Payne. I am gonna share with you today some of my own story of having been a promiscuous teen. And so if this is something that you're going through or you have a friend whose daughter or son is going through this, I do hope that you share this with them so that they can begin to understand and connect with their teenager um, rather than trying to discipline or punish this out of their teenager. Because I guarantee you, even though that feels like that might be the best solution to cut that off at the pass and stop it right now, it's only gonna make the problem worse. All right, I have a ton of notes, so I'm going to stick with that. Um, welcome everyone, I know it's near the holidays, so I'm glad that you're here watching. If you're watching on YouTube, give me a subscribe. If you're here on Instagram, give me a follow and let's jump in, shall we? Okay, the first thing I need to say is that I understand that teen promiscuity can be very frightening as a parent because we all know that biologically there can be some significant um, lifelong consequences, outcomes <laughs> to this. So I understand this can be very frightening. It is not helpful ever to label and use phrases, whether they are in front of your teenager or not, because if you're, excuse me, if you are using these labels, this says a lot about what you feel and what you think that may not be helping the situation. So terms like sex pot, my teenager is just a sex pot. Um, my, I hear this one all the time about teen girls. My teenager is so sex crazy, so boy crazy. I think they're a sex addict. Okay, I understand that those labels and terms come from a place of fear. They come from a place of your messaging and what you were taught. Those labels are not helpful, specifically if you're using them toward your teen. So let's, mm, let's just remove those very judgmental labels, okay? It does not make, this doesn't make you a bad parent and your, your teenager is not like inherently flawed. So yeah, let's move away from the labels. If you're like me, you were raised, especially, I hear this all the time, I was not raised Catholic, but if you were raised Catholic, basically this is a giant packet of sin. So um, no, no, I understand that might be how you were raised. I was also raised being taught that sex was dirty, um, like sexual curiosity, sexual drive um, was dirty, it was shameful, it was bad, it was sinful. Um, yeah, I'm gonna say that none of those are true. Like none, N none of those are true. So even though that's how you may have been raised, it's also how I was raised. Um, and so it beca becomes this like sex in itself or sexual curiosity becomes this, this hidden bad thing that should only happen in the dark and, and like it must be clouded in like demons and we should never talk about it. Bullshit. Okay, that's what I have to say about that. Okay, um, so labels are not true, they're not helpful. I have done a previous um, full video all about teens, dating, and sex. A lot of what I'm gonna talk about today, well, 
This, the, they overlap, let me just say. My previous video and the one I've done uh, that I'm doing today. So if you would like the link, just send me a message on Instagram with, that you'd like the link. If you can't find it, it's on my YouTube channel. It's here on Instagram, Teens Dating and Sex. I'm not gonna go totally into that, um, but if you want the link, please feel free to ask. Um, okay, so, uh, sorry, I need to flip the page on my notes here and find where I'm going, okay. So the one thing that I cannot stress enough is that sexual desire is normal. It is how we are created to physiologically develop sexual desire. Okay, that's normal. It's also not dirty or bad. Uh, however, there is more to teen promiscuity than simply sexual curiosity or physical like desire. There's a lot more to it. And I, this is the biggest part that I want you to understand if this is a challenge that you're struggling with your teenager or someone that you know um, is struggling with. This is not just about the physical. So please don't kid yourself. Do not be fooled. Mm -mm, it's not true. It's one portion of it, okay? So let's talk about the physical for one second, okay? Um, again, I'm going to share some of my personal story. Uh, so I am very kinesthetic. What that means is I experience my life very much at a cellular level in my body. I'm very, very kinesthetic. Um, I loved to move. I loved sports. I loved to dance. Um, I just experienced and expressed myself through physical movement, physical experience. That, that's what kinesthetic means. It's K-I-N-E-S-T-E uh, or S-H-E, sorry, I-T-C. Wow, I totally messed that up. K-I-N-E-S-T-H-E-T-I-C, kinesthetic. Look it up if you want, okay? Um, I was very much in my body and I was very clear on what felt good and what I, what I liked, even though it was very shameful, I knew this by the time I was seven years old. I knew exactly where to rub and what felt good at seven years old, okay? Now, lots of people say to me, oh, well, kids can only know that if they've been abused. I, again, I call bullshit. That unfortunately may be part of it but it certainly is not all of it. My best friend, when I was where we used to live growing up, her daughter was exactly like me as a young child. Wildly kinesthetic, so familiar with her body and what movement and what felt good and what didn't. And she started being curious about her own body at three and four years old. And that's not abnormal. Okay, that's not abnormal for people, to, for young kids, young girls or boys. I don't care what your sexual identity is either. It's irrelevant, um, nor am I going to judge any of that, okay? For young girls to, parents to walk in on, on really young girls, like rocking back and forth on their floor, um, on pillows, in the mirror, on the bathroom counter with their legs open in front of the mirror, like getting all, you know, curious about the lady bits, you know, for boys to have hands down their pants. Why? Because it feels good. So can we just hang on a second before we go saying there must be something wrong? No, that, that's actually how we were created. <laughs> that's how it was supposed to work. Some children are much more body aware, sensation aware than others. That is all, okay? Also in how we are created. So um, it's not abnormal for very young children to unconsciously figure out what masturbating looks like, even if it's just, like I said, rubbing on the floor, on their pillows, um, like, you know, little boys in their car seats, uh, like that, little girls, it, it doesn't matter. It, it's normal, okay? Um, it's not dirty. It's not dirty. So let, let's stop the labeling, please, so that we're not raising more parents who are just completely weirded out about 
sexuality or physicality of sex. Okay. Um, here's what we used to say to our kids. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, interesting. Very quiet comment section. <laughs> yeah. Also less viewers than normal. Hmm. Uncomfortable topic. Okay. Um, here's what we used to say to our kids. What we used to say is that like our kids, so I have two boys, I'm a boy mom. Um, and our boys would sometimes get out of the car and they, they're like, I don't know, six, seven, eight, nine, and they would have an erection, which is normal for kids when they've been sitting in a car, kind of half sleepy, whatever. And they'd say, they'd say to us, mommy, look, it's really hard. And I'd be like, yep, that's normal. Happens sometimes, you know, or they'd say to me, you know, it feels good when I touch it. I'm like, yep, that's normal. And then here's what we would say. Those are your private parts. Your private parts are private. They are intended only for you to touch and no one else, only you. And of course, then there was the whole like sexual safety and, and bad touch and good touch. Anyway, but I'm not going to get into that right now. What we just say is, yeah, those are your privates and, and that's for you to explore or touch in private. And if you ever want to ask us about it, you're totally welcome to. And so... That's how we normalized it is, yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Erections are normal and you know, that might feel good. Yeah, sure. That's for you and you alone. So it was about it, them understanding that that was something that was very sacred for their body and it was only for them, no one else, um, but normalizing it, not shaming it, okay? Um, so I recommend very, very highly to talk about physicality and, and sexual development early on because your teenager's brain is full of hormones. In fact, the tween brain. So even though a young child may have a great deal of physicality and body awareness, it doesn't mean that their brain is full of hormones. Like the hormone development doesn't start until the pituitary gland explodes in the brain. Um, and that could be, it could be anywhere from 10 to 16. It really depends on your child. The point is to normalize physical awareness and then to talk about body development and sexuality very early. So actually when, when I was young, our parents, my parents bought us um, a book, a very graphic book that it was intended for children, very age appropriate. And they bought us a book and we could look through this book. Like we knew by the time we were eight, like how sex worked and it talked about sperm and how the sperm meets the eggs and, and the man's like penis and the, the vagina. And it talked about all of that. So yeah, it was still awkward, but it, like we knew it wasn't like a shocker, mind blowing revelation that we all of a sudden had at 12 years old. We did the same for our kids. We bought them the book called It's Not the Stork. It's not the stork. And um, that book um, was something that we read with our kids um, regularly. We read with them as like, it was like a bedtime story. If that's the one that they chose, then that's the one that we would read. And we made all that really normal body parts and um, the reproductive systems. And yeah, so the, fat, the sooner you can make that normal, the better. It's Not the Stork is a book in a series of age appropriate books. So if this isn't something you've done earlier, that's great. No problem. Look up It's Not the Stork and then find out what the tween or teen version of that is and get the book. Just start. Okay. Um, all right. So what I want to dis help you distinguish is there is a physical desire now, what happens in the teenage brain physically, okay, is that when the pituitary gland explodes and your teenager is now, your tween, actually tween or teen, is now entering puberty, they are a giant cesspool of incredible hormones. Wild, wild cesspool of hormones. Those hormones increase testosterone and estrogen. In, in both boys and girls, mostly estrogen, but testosterone in girls, and mostly testosterone, but also estrogen in boys, okay? That is what, those are necessary for sexual development, for reproductive 
um, preparedness in the body, those are also normal and those hormones do increase physical curiosity, physical desire, um, you know, growing pubic hair, um, you know, all of those things. Those are normal and necessary. So those are going to happen in the brain. So for you to think, if, if you came from a background where um, physical awareness or sexual awareness was, was very bad and shunned and shameful, that might be a real challenge for you. And I love and accept you and you are welcome here. Um, because your teenager is going to go through this. This isn't something they can stop. This isn't something that they can avoid. This isn't something that makes them bad. It makes them human, actually. Makes them human, okay? Um, so the physical desire is a part of their, um, of their developing brain. They're, they're normalizing all of their, their hormones that are increasing, and that is based on physiology, physiological development, that is what's having them become more sexual beings. And yes, it happens at 12 and 14 and 16. And no, that doesn't make your teenager bad. That's just how they're developing. Okay, I've said enough about that. All right, I wanna move on to the emotional part of this, okay? Because if there is, if you are, if you are noticing that you feel that your, your teenager's very sexual and you know, you're really worried about this, um, that um, there is a lot, um, you have a lot of concern or maybe you've already caught your teen, you know, um, being sexually curious or, or even sexually active and your first response out of fear and great concern for them, of course, is to punish or consequence, which drives home a shaming message that they aren't okay. It's not gonna work. If you are only paying attention to the physical part, like the behavior, what you're seeing, you are missing everything that's going on below the surface. And that is what I'm here to explain a little bit today by sharing my own story, okay? So now let's talk about the emotional part of sex. And you might be thinking, well, my teenager isn't mature enough to think about the emotional part of sex. They just, they just think it's just sex and they tell me it's for nothing. Uh-huh, yeah, I know I've been there, been there personally, okay? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain a little bit of this, okay? Your teen may be using sex or the physical um, act, physical desire, attention to fill an emotional need, okay? For your young teen or your mid-teen or whatever, they may be using the physical attention, sexual attention to fill an emotional need. Okay, um, here's the other thing that happens in the teen brain during adolescence and during, during puberty, okay? Is that as a function of their physiological brain development, their self-esteem can go down up to 30%. Their self-esteem and self-confidence can drop up to 30%. So the reason why that is, is because their brain is actually rewriting their identity. Yep, that's a bit scary. Yes, this video will be on my IGTV and it will also be on YouTube, on my YouTube channel, very momentarily. Um, so as their brain is rewriting their identity, that I'm just saying that's slightly frightening. And if it happened to more adults, there'd be a lot more drugs for that. Can you even imagine who you knew you were up to about the age of 10 and then your brain starts rewriting? The reason for that is their brain is going from a simple computing system to a more complex computing system. And in that process, it is rewriting its identity in a more complex way. So in that time, their self-esteem is very shaky, can drop up to 30%. Their brains are hugely susceptible to comparison, 
criticism and judgment. Okay, so stick with me on that. You've got this hugely insecure teenager who is now that who is now perhaps using physical attention, sexual attention to fill an emotional need. And you're like, okay, well, what the heck do I do with that, Allie? Like, I've tried consequencing, I've tried grounding, I've tried, you know, wow, all the things. Okay, but that's not what they need. It's not what they need. Here's my experience. I came from, if you've watched any of my previous videos, um, I came from a, a very emotionally abusive home. There was literally not a single positive thing ever said, pretty much, okay? It was all about everything I was doing wrong. Um, I was stupid, I wasn't smart enough, I was fat, I was a pig, I was a slut, I was a whore, um, I was a piece of shit, I was a disappointment. I hate to be graphic with you, but that's just the beginning. And it was that every day, all day, from the time I was about six or so. Uh, so those were the kind of very negative messages that I received on a daily basis. And P.S. I was a straight A student and I was an award winning athlete. Never mentioned in my house, never mentioned, never commented, never rewarded, just never mentioned. So there was really only negative reinforcement. Now, my nose always gets itchy when I go live. I don't know why. Ugh. Um, so what I was learning, what the stories I was making up based on, I was also somewhat physically abused. It was a, um, a very scary place for me um, that my, my parents, um, when they felt they snapped, um, I was often hit um, out of nowhere. It was very scary. I walked on eggshells. I never know when it was going to come out. Sometimes it was a spatula. Sometimes it was a wooden spoon. And it was like sharp and sudden right away. Not what I experienced as a loving environment. Now, it is normal for the human brain to seek love and safety. That's normal. Okay, so I thought, boys, this must be it. Boys must be the answer. Because, just bear with me for a second, most of my experience, negative experience of this came from my relationship with my mom. Now, uh, just quick sentence, my mother is not the spawn of Satan. She got dramatically worse than I got. So if she was never taught anything else and she gave me better than she got, then she did an okay job. Didn't work for me, it wasn't okay. Um, but that doesn't make her a horrible person. So um, what I made up in my brain was that I was unloved, unworthy, um, I was dirty, I was broken, um, and I was horribly lonely, horribly lonely. I just wanted to feel safe and feel loved and special and cherished. And because I had this relationship with my mom, I sought out boys because girls honestly were quite scary to me because of the story I was making up about female relationships. Now I had girlfriends, but I sought out boys. I did not have a relationship with my dad, even though my dad lived in our house. It was very traditional. My dad went to work or sat behind a newspaper. I really didn't have a relationship with him. So I thought, well, boys must be safer. So I sought out boys, not only because I was a very physical being um, and very athletic, and so I had a lot of boy friends, but I sought out boys because I thought, well, that must be love then. That, that must be love. So I was seeking positive physical attention. Did I want sex? No. I actually found sex really scary. Honestly, I did. What I wanted was someone to hold me. I wanted someone to tell me I was okay. I wanted to feel loved and special. But boys no cut against boys, but boys are also wired to show a lot of emotional expression through their physicality. 
And so I was sending off a message that said, hey, hey, let's get on. And I was, you know, like, I'm not saying I deserved what I got. I'm just saying I, I was playing into and thought that sex was the way to feel loved. I didn't like it. Like, like I liked it, but I didn't put it this way. It did not scratch my itch. It didn't scratch the itch. It was like having a, an itch right here and scratching right here. Like I, it was never matching. I was like a bucket with a hole in the bottom. It wouldn't have mattered how much everyone, uh, boys were pouring into that because I had a hole in the bottom. And that hole was because I did not believe that I was worthy. I did not believe that I deserved love. I did not believe all those things. So it wouldn't have mattered how much I went out and I sought all this love and attention. It would never have been enough. Not to mention it was very destructive because I got treated really badly. Um, still looking for that sense of love and attention. So um, I'm not saying that you are abusing your child the way I was emotionally and somewhat physically abused. I'm not saying that you're doing that. N not at all. What I am saying is that the way your teenager receives love may be different than the way that you are giving it. And that is a fundamental part of how our brains are wired. Okay, so let's talk about the five love languages. Five Love Languages by Dr. Gary Chapman. It is a free quiz. I absolutely recommend that you go on and take the free quiz. And if your teenager is willing, don't make them. But if your teenager is willing, do it with your teenager. Let them do the quiz and you do the quiz. Because what Dr. Ch Gary Chapman has determined is that we are likely to give love in the way that works for us, which is not a way that works for everyone else, okay? So to give you an example, okay, my top two love languages are physical touch and words of affirmation. So I grew up in a home where physical touch was very sharp and painful and sudden and frightening. And I, I needed physical touch to feel loved. I still do to this day. I literally cry on the massage table. I cry every time I get a massage because it's such positive loving touch and I'm a hugger look out if you ever meet me because I'm a hugger because to me that's such positive touch that's what I needed in on my skin I needed that didn't get that words of affirmation as I already explained that was a long way from what I got at home in a very verbally and emotionally abusive home I didn't get words of affirmation ever so those for me, were two of the key reasons I now understand that I became promiscuous at a young age, looking desperately for someone to just say that I had value, that I was lovable, that I deserved respect, that I was worthy, that I was special, that I was good at something. And so what I became good at was sex. I became good at sex. I learned how to be good at sex. Because at least then, people desired me for something. And I know, yes, this will be recorded. It will be on my, my Instagram and my YouTube very shortly. Um, that feels hard to say, but it's true. <laughs> I made sure I became good at sex because then people at least wanted me for something. Because it didn't matter what I did at home. Remember I told you I was a straight A student and award-winning athlete. That got no positive affirmation whatsoever. So if I got good at sex, at least people said I was good at something. And I felt valued about that even if it felt yucky and it didn't scratch the itch, never did. Okay, so the five love languages are critical because I get this all the time. I hear from teenagers, my parents don't love me. Well, I'm pretty sure they're your parents, you do love your teenager. You just might have a disconnect in how you are expressing that love relative to how your teenager, um, your teenager's brain is wired to receive it. 
Okay, so it's really important to close that gap and that's a really easy way to do it. The five love languages quiz by Dr. Gary Chapman, just so that um, I'm clear, there, the five love languages are physical touch, words of affirmation, quality time may be a reason that your teen is seeking out physical affection in an unhealthy way. Uh -huh. Yeah, I know. You're not alone. You're not alone. Um, quality time, okay. Um, sorry, I just, uh, acts of service, which is like helping, like a clean your car for someone or help them clean their room or acts of service, doing kind things for someone. And then gifts is the fifth one. Okay. Fifth is gifts. Okay. So here are some ways that you can help to combat what you might see as some frightening signals, or maybe this is already happening for you along with everything I've already said, okay? Date your daughter or your son in a healthy way, of course. So if I'm a boy mom, so for boys, it's really critical that boys learn how to treat women and that women reinforce that positive behavior. So in our house, our boys were taught from a young age to open the door for me. My husband would say to them, you go ahead. And then of course the doors were really heavy when they were little and he would help them open the door for me. Um, opening car doors, my boys like run to the back door when I come home with groceries to help me bring the groceries in. Um, how to treat a lady. And then when I when they do it, I always say to them, thank you, I feel so respected. So I'm reinforcing the way, the respectful, healthy, loving ways that they're treating me so that they know about that for, for young, for women, for young women that they might be around. Now there's lots more about this I've covered in a previous video called Teens Dating and Sex. And if you can't find it on my Instagram or on my YouTube, just message me and I will get you the link. Okay, because it, it's it overlaps this. I also did a video on helping your teen create healthy relationships that is critical around the whole dating thing. So if you can't find that one, message me. I'll make sure you get that, okay? Um, dads, date your daughters for heaven's sakes. Date your daughters. And I mean, leave the back door, come on back through the front door, dressed in a nice suit with a flower and take your daughter out for lunches, for dinners. I don't care how old they are. I don't care. Start young. Open car doors for them. Open doors to, to cafes, to restaurants. Open, move their chair out before they sit down. Be polite. Be respectful. Teach your daughter what it's like to have a healthy, loving relationship where they feel cherished and special and, and they feel like they're safe. Give them that measuring stick to use in their life. And same with young men. Okay, you've got, we got to give them a measuring stick or how the hell are, are, are we supposed to tell them about this? How, how are we supposed to, and then we're shocked when they go out and we find out they're like pimping themselves out. Well, when did we have the conversation? I know it's uncomfortable. Oh my goodness, I know it's uncomfortable. I have literally sat in my son's room in my head going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, <gasps> this isn't happening. And on the outside, I'm like, yes, yes, let's have this conversation. I am so calm. And inside I'm like literally freaking out. Don't care, have it anyway. Have it anyway, okay? I want you to show your children what healthy, loving, respectful relationships look like from the opposite sex. So daughters and dads and sons and moms. Because if you have a, a mom, if you're a mom who I know moms based on statistics carry most of the workload, um, and we let our sons tr use us and treat us with disrespect, then what we're setting them up is that, that they're going to have a partner who they can treat with complete disrespect and use and, dis and abuse. Like that's a no, 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 mm -mm, not on my watch. And, and same with daughters. If they have, I had no relationship with my dad, literally none. We lived in the same house. So I had nothing to compare to. Okay, let's give our kids something to measure against. Um, all right. This is the part that I, that I want to say, um, reaffirm, um, oh, sorry. I'm moving ahead of myself. Okay. So if your teenager is showing some, some 
concerning behaviors around looking for sex, for, for affirmation, for validation, for all of those things, the more that you use labels, the more that you punish or consequence through grounding, um, shaming, that, you know, the more you are actually going to reinforce their negative beliefs about themselves, like I'm not worthy, I don't deserve love, um, or what love is, okay, you're reinforcing those messages. You're not, you're not helping them, you're reinforcing them. Even though I know your intentions are good to keep them safe, I totally understand that, okay? Um, so it's, sorry, I'm just looking at my notes here. Um, it's really, really important that rather than creating more disconnection where they feel more and more unsafe to talk to you about these things, please stop. Please stop, okay? Now, I wanna say this. You are not responsible for your teenager's choices. You are not responsible for your teenager's mental or emotional health. However, as their parent, you do play a very key role. Okay, so I just want to draw that boundary that you are not responsible for their choices or their mental or physical or mental or emotional health, but you do play a very key role in it. Okay, so how can you change that? Well, Remember, sexual desire is normal. It's how we were created, okay? It's not dirty, it's not sinful, it's not wrong. Forget all the labels, please. You don't have a sex pot. Your, your daughter's not, not boy crazy. You don't have a sex addict. Please just stop. They are normally developing. It's what they do with those desires that you wanna have the conversation about. The desires are normal. It's what they do about the desires. And just in case you're wondering if you have this conversation and you like break open Pandora's box with your kid that all of a sudden you're condoning and telling them that they can go have sex. Nope, actually science has proven that is incorrect. Thus the very long and decades old argument about why sex ed in schools is important and the statistics around the teenage promiscuity that has gone way down the more we talk about it when they're young and curious are in irrefutable. So no, it's not condoning and it's not saying it's gonna go happen. Science has proven that wrong. So let's just move past that one, okay? Um, so here, here is what I want to say to wrap up. Create a safe environment. Um, well, that's a great question. Parents are not responsible for, my parents were, didn't make me go choose anything. Okay, they played a really key role in the way that I perceived my physical body and my emotional needs. But that, that was my choice. That was my choice to do that. They, they are not responsible for my choices. They didn't make me go choose that. They played a really big role in the way that I thought about myself and the way I was raised. But my choices are mine and their choices are theirs. So I think once we cross that line into trying to own each other's choices, then we also make up that we can be more controlling and authoritarian and actually control people, and we can't. So that's why I'm careful of that line. So here's how you can work with this with your teenager. First of all, create safety by listening. Get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Let's talk about the S word. Let's talk about sex, okay? Um, I, there's a, I have a whole script and how to do that in my previous videos on sex dating, uh, teens dating and sex. So you can watch that for the script and, and how to kind of do that. Um, just listen. That's it. Just listen. If your teenager comes home and they're asking you questions about, about sex or about physical relationships, it doesn't mean they're doing it. It doesn't mean that they're going to go do it. They're curious. So before you go jumping to conclusions because how uh, you were raised, which I want you to look at yourself, how were you raised? What are the messages that you were taught? Are they true? How are they impacting your relationship with your teenager right now? I'm just asking, okay? Um, get So create that safe place by being the place, like again, it, it was wildly uncomfortable for me but I was sitting there in that moment going, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe this is happening, both because I was like weirded out by it, but at the same time, I was like, wow, my kids actually think this is safe enough. They can talk to me about this. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, so um, that's number one. Create safety by listening. Number two, reinforce character traits. Reinforce things that you see in your child. So for instance, with me, I was 
super academic smarty pants. I was super athletic. They could have said, you know, wow, you know, you're so smart. It's amazing how you do that. And I also helped a lot of kids when even from the time I was very young, I was supposed to skip a grade and I didn't. So I ended up helping teachers with which was really gross and weird and awkward. But anyway, you know, that I loved helping people that, um, that I was caring, that I was kind, that um, I was reliable, that reliable or um, creative. Um, stay away from gender compliments, like with girls. Stay away from you're pretty, you're beautiful. Um, you can be like, oh wow, that's a beautiful hairstyle. Like, so how did you even do that? Or, you know, your makeup looks great or something, but stay away from, use things like intelligent, brave, courageous, kind, um, um, you know, consistent, reliable, um, anything, affirm character traits. Affirm your child's character traits. Let them know you see them. You see them and you take pleasure in who they are. I know that's hard sometimes as a teenager, wildly difficult, I totally get it. But that you cherish them, you believe in them, you think they are a good person who has value and worth. Because they get that from you. They get that from you. So affirm character traits. Find right. Thank them for anything that they're doing right. Just pick one minuscule little thing in the day and compliment or thank them for doing that right. You know, um, maybe they, they grumpily helped you get the recycling out or something. You'd be like, thanks for helping me. I feel really respected. You know, just say kind comments, even though it can be extremely tough. I know, I challenge you to find one thing and let them know that they're doing right, okay? Please stop labeling. Stop the sinful, dirty, negative labeling around sex. Just stop it. Because you'll make it a dark, dungeness, hidden um, thing where the curiosity around it is only gonna grow. So just stop it, okay? High five. Well done for doing that affirmation. Good job. Um, okay, last point. What if they pick bad people? But like, but like, what do you, what if they pick a terrible partner? I don't care what their sexual orientation is. What if they pick a terrible partner and you hate that person and they're a really bad influence? Let's go there, shall we? Why do you think they pick them? Why do you think they pick them? Your teenager will pick people who are a reflection of the, what they believe about their value and what they believe about themselves. So don't try to go getting mad and dissing and like, ah, how could you pick someone like that? Why do you think? Because they're picking someone that matches what they believe about themselves. Start there. Behaviors all come from emotions. Emotions are the source. Behavior is the symptom. Emotions are where beliefs and values are stored. So before you go getting on your teenager about who they're picking as a partner, let that be known that is a reflection of what they believe they are worth. And again, I already did a video on that about uh, helping your teen build healthy relationships. So if you can't find that, just send me a message, I'll get you the link, okay? So do not focus on the behavior itself. Remember that physiologically, sexual development and physical awareness is human. It is normal. Okay. Um, your teenager is not damaged and you are not a bad parent. Okay? Your teenager is not damaged and you're not a bad parent. If you're not sure how to navigate this, send me a message. I'll do another video. Okay? But between this one and then the teen dating and sex one and then creating healthy relationships, these three, three together, I'm really hoping, have put together a, a more well-rounded view of how you can, number one, support your teenager emotionally through their physical changes and to normalize and equip and empower your teenager to know what their body is for and what, um, what kind of choices you might want them to make around that without no, without ever having to, because I will say this, you cannot have your teenager share the same beliefs and values as you. I'm sorry. I am sorry you cannot. 
Your values and beliefs are critical for them to know and understand, but not because you're telling them what they have to believe or what they have to value. That just won't happen. So that's what I mean by get curious. You can share yours with your teenager, but then you get curious about, tell me what you think and then zip it and listen. Just listen. And that will help you connect to build that safety for further conversations. Okay. Um, how did I feel worthy of my husband? Well, that's very interesting. My husband and I met when we were 13. <laughs> uh, so we've been, and we were like almost best friends from the time we were 15 to 25, uh, essentially like best friends, like dating other people, but like best friends. And then we just decided to get married. So, um, he was my best friend. He was the person that I felt safest with the person that I felt treated me the best because I, he knew how to be my friend first. He didn't see me as a piece of meat. And so I didn't feel like I had to deliver with him. So yeah, that's who I ended up marrying was someone I met when I was 13. Um, now that pre creates other issues because we were friends for 10 years before we had ever, we never even really dated. We were just great friends who went out for dinner all the time and talked, complained about our boyfriends and girlfriends. So we also never really dated. So we've had to do a lot of work around what that was like. Like, how do we make that transition from friends to dating? And we didn't do it well a lot of the time. So we're not perfect either. We're far from it. Okay. Um, yes, Safina, many teenagers wish they want their parents to that. Okay. Um, one last thing I'm going to close with. What if your teenager... Uh, what if there's consequences to their physicality and, and curiosity? For instance, assault or pregnancy. That is not a reason to reaffirm the bad choices that you think your teenager has made. Those are the times where your teenager most needs to know that they're not dirty, they're not broken, they're not used, that they're loved. And you'll do everything you can to help them to heal and to see their value the way that you see them. So if your teenager's promiscuity leads to an assault, that is not the time to go in guns a That is not the time for you to decide that you're right. That's not the time for you to be self-righteous and make sure your teenager knows how right you are and how wrong they are. That is not the time to let your teenager know that they had it coming. If that is going to be how you approach that situation, I guarantee you will never have a relationship with your teenager. What they need is safety and love and healing and acceptance. And maybe that's an opportunity for you to start over. Not because you're responsible for what happened to them, but because you play a very key role in that. If your teenager, um, your teenage daughter or your teen son now is involved in a, in a teen pregnancy, that is also not the time to get all lecturing and self-righteous and to disown your child. Okay? That is the time where you, I hope, are the safe person for them to come and talk to to help them decide options, to let them know that they're loved and that you'll be beside them. And yeah, it might be hard, but you're gonna get through it together somehow. That's the last thing I wanna say about that, is let's be careful as parents what we wanna be right about. Let's be careful as parents what moral judgment we are passing on our teenagers. And let's be careful about labeling um, and your childhood experience overlaying theirs. The more you're willing to get curious about that, the more this topic can be safer and easier to discuss. And you might be able to change the experience your teenager is having relative to the one that you had. I want to thank you so much for joining me today. Again, if you're here on Instagram, give me a follow. If you're watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. If you're not already on my email list where I send out weekly newsletters about all these kinds of topics, you're going to want to hit the link in my bio here on Instagram and then hit the button that says get weekly tips to your inbox so that we stay in touch and I will send you this every week and other topics like it. I want to thank you so much. Again, my name is Allie Payne. 
Please share this with anyone who you feel is struggling, teenagers or parents who need to know that they're not alone. And if you have any other questions, please reach out to me on Instagram at Allie Payne. I am happy to do whatever I can to find you whatever resources you would find helpful. Thank you so much for joining me today. I know this was an uncomfortable topic. I wish you all a wonderful day. Bye.